Yeah, all right. There we go. All right, let's start reading. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. All right, now Nicodemus is, uh, how many of you have Nike shoes or Nike shirts, Nike jacket? You know what Nike means, right? Victor or victorious. And the, the Nike symbol, I, I could be the perfect spokesman for Nike. You know, I've got, <laughs> I've got the fingers if they would just hire me to do that. Um, it means ruler over the people. And so this guy was the Old Testament teacher. He was the Old Testament scholar over all of Israel. So he should have known better than the conversation that he's about to have. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these things, do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is the first confusing thing to Nicodemus that Jesus says. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Uh, that's, would you say that's a silly question? Okay. Now keep in mind that he's talking about physical birth. Jesus answered, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. So what is that a reference to? Physical birth. This is not baptism, okay? Except he be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Again, a reference to physical birth. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe it if I tell you of heavenly things? And that, so, let me stop real quick. Is Nicodemus saved? Guys, lost as a ball in high grass at this point. All right? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right, let's stop right there. Um, according to the National Board, the National uh, Retail Federation Board, Americans spend an average of $172.22 on Mother's Day. Now that's $21.4 billion nationwide on Mother's Day. We spend $19.7 billion on Valentine's Day. Chocolate and flowers and cards. That's a lot of chocolate, by the way. Um, we're going to spend $465 billion at Christmas this year. Gifts are expensive, are they not? Uh, but they're expressive. And as a matter of fact, we let people know how we feel about them by what we give to them. If you have a casual acquaintance and they have a birthday or an you might give them, uh, I don't know, a, a $10 gift card to Duncan. Not incredibly expensive. You guys, it's your anniversary. Give your wife a $10 gift card to Duncan. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Um, an acquaintance is going to get probably on the lighter end of your budget. And the closer people are to you, the heavier you're going to spend for them. And I understand that. Now, there are, there are two factors in gifting. And the first one is you give what people want. You know, when uh, somebody's going to get married, usually it's the young lady. She will have a store where, uh, where you know, you can go online or go in that store. And, you know, she's registered with that store. And sometimes they will even tell you specifically, I need a blender 
Uh, we need this, we need that. She'll put specific things on there. And so we give people what they want. And the second thing, we give people what they need. Um, our gifts should leave a memory in the hearts of people. How many of you are wearing something right now that someone that you love dearly gave you? A piece of jewelry? Okay. Uh, but uh, when, you, when you look at that, what do you think of? How much it cost? Or the person that gave it to you? You know, you, you look at your wedding ring. And, or you look at a bracelet or, or a necklace or something that, uh, that someone has given to you. And this, the gift is just one more thing that you have in common with this person. And it, it binds you. And uh, the more expensive the gift, quite often the closer the connection is and the closer the relationship. Because everybody loves to receive gifts. That's one of the five love languages that uh, Gary Chapman tells us about in his book, The Five Love Languages, is, um, you know, gifting. And how many of you just love to get a gift? You should really enjoy it. All right? The rest of you don't care? Okay. <laughs> Um, well, we, we love being appreciated. We love being loved. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of effort that should go into choosing the right gift for somebody. And John 3.16 is one of those places in Scripture that reveals the heart of God. If anybody ever doubts, and I've heard people say, well, you know, if, if God was a God of love, just stop right there. Read John 3.16. The Bible tells us, for God so, and the word so doesn't mean so much. It's just it's this great big amount of love for us. It, it's not talking about volume. The word so there is in such a condition. So God loved us in such a condition. His love for us was such that he did this. He didn't buy us a new car. He didn't get you a new house. He didn't get you a gift card to Duncan. He did something so much more significant than that. And there is no limit to God's gift budget. God is the creator of heaven and earth. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, plus the hills, plus the gold in the hills. And so God is not limited in any way. And so he knows exactly what to give us. So let's, let's back up to the two things we mentioned earlier. God gives gifts that people want. And I'll explain that in a moment. And he gives gifts that people need. Now, now let's go back to this thing of God that gave what people wanted. People all over the world right now are worshiping. Man innately knows he's not right with somebody. False religion is based on the, on, the, on the premise we need to be made right with somebody. Now, false religion may say, well, you know, the sun is God. The wind is God. The world is God. Uh, you know, We've we got all kind of things that we call God. And we need to make sure that this God is happy with us. That's why false religion and pagan religion is centered around people sacrificing to their God. You know, they're offering a chicken or... Uh, you know, they're bringing some kind of a gift to this God to do what? To placate the God, to calm the God down. Gods are always mad. You ever notice that in, in false religion? I always have to bring something to calm them down. You know, just be calm. We, you know, we love you. And, uh, but we have this innate desire and need to be made right with someone we think is greater than we are. Now, is there anything accurate about that? Yes. But does man know to whom he needs to be made right? No. See, that, that is the part that, that people are unaware of. Now, uh, there, are, there are two faiths in the world. There are over 5,000 religions, but there are only two, faiths, only two types of faith. Number one, there's a kind of faith that is just simply called autosoterism, and it means self-salvation. And then number two, there's salvation by grace. Every religion, every major faith in the world is based on this false idea of autosoterism. You save yourself. You're the hero in your salvation story. You, uh, you do good stuff. You be nice. Uh, you, and, and if you do that, then that God will 
save you. Well, Satan has infiltrated human culture with this idea that there's a God that needs to be placated and, and pleased, but it's not the God of heaven. It's not the God of heaven. He is the one that designed false religion. And he did this early in the book of Genesis through a guy by the name of Nimrod who had, in, in my estimation, uh, the greatest influence on the world beside Jesus Christ of any human being that's ever lived. Nimrod founded it was called the Mystery Religions. And he was kind of a weird guy. Um, he married his mother. Yeah. And her name was Samarimus. And here's the story. Now keep in mind, we're talking about early, early, early Genesis. And here's the story that was put out. He was finally, he was a hunter. And they wrote songs about Nimrod being a mighty hunter before the Lord and uh, history says that he was killed by a giant wild boar. And he, before he got killed, he would wrestle bulls. He would fight bulls, kill the bull, break the bull's neck. He would skin the bull and wear that suit, the bull suit, his skin, as a sign of victory. So we've got horns. We've got a tail. Where do you think our picture of Satan comes from? Do you think Satan is ugly and has horns and a tail? No, not at all. The Bible says that he disguises himself as an angel of light. And so when he died, here's what his mother said. That this, this child, and by the way, she got pregnant again with, with another baby. And she said that this child that she now is pregnant with, that Nimrod is gone, I was impregnated by a ray of sunlight. That this child is going to be the resurrection of, of Nimrod, who, by the way, was the savior of his people. He died a very violent death, and in death, death was defeated, and that he would come back, of course, in the form of this new baby. Does that sound familiar? Where did that come from 4,000 years before Christ was born as a child in Bethlehem? Satanic influence came down to human culture and dumped this vomited this this idea into human culture so that every major religious system in the world is based on a mother and her son and the son in these false religions is always the subservient one it's always mom who is in charge now we as, as human beings, we live here in the West, we, in the United States, and we for the most part have been exposed to the gospel, the truth about the God we're not right with, the God of heaven. And this matter of being saved, according to the Bible, it is a simple, simple fact that all a person has to do is to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came into this world for the specific purpose of dying our death. Now, man knows he's wrong. Man knows that he's, he's not right with somebody. And so, God gave us something that we wanted. We want to be made right with God. That's, that's just a natural part. The Gentile had the law in his heart, Scripture says. The Jew had it written on paper. The same law. See, you find, a, you find me a culture where they do not believe murder is wrong or stealing is wrong. See, man has this innate knowledge of right and wrong. Now, it's not very well defined. I'm aware of that. But we've got this innate knowledge that we need to be made right with somebody. All right? God gave us what we want. We wanted to be made right. Well, here's who you're made right with. The Son of God comes into culture. He is born from the womb of a virgin. He is born as the perfect, sinless Son of God. He has no sin account. Therefore, He is the perfect one, the perfect vehicle on which the sin of the world can be loaded because there is no pre-incarnate sin nature in Him. He's perfect. He's without sin. 
And so there was room for our sin nature to be put on him. He was, in fact, the garbage scowl onto which the sin of the world was dumped on Calvary. He was crucified for our sin, did away with it. You believe that? See, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's really simple. Now, God has given us what we want. And there's, there's proof all around the world of this. That man has just got to be made right with somebody. And in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, and verse number 13, the Lord says to Jeremiah, My people have committed two sins. Number one, they have abandoned me, the fountain of living waters. And number two, they have digged their own wells, cisterns that can hold no water. So what have we, as a culture of human beings, what have we done? We have walked away from the God of the Bible, and what have we done? We have taken these philosophical post hole diggers, and we have digged a hole, and we're trying to drink from the cisterns and the holes of our own construction, and they're full of moral, philosophical, religious poison. And Satan is thrilled to death that we are drinking this stuff. It is spreading around the world. AI church now is the latest thing that's just exploding worldwide. AI now has its own speakers, uh, has its... Uh, I was watching one here just a few weeks ago, and it was, uh, now what, do you, what do you call these AI figures? What do you call those? Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a woman that was talking, and she was like, uh, you don't need God to worship. We're bringing heaven down to you. And this building was full of people. They just went nuts. They went nuts. You realize that human beings will, will drink anything that sounds religious? even if it's poison, and that is pure poison. And so this is spreading around the world, and what's happening, the God of the Bible is being rejected to a deeper degree than ever before. And so God gave us what we wanted. We just didn't know this is what we needed, which is the second thing. God gave us what we need. Um, we are a broken species. We are moral felons. We didn't do anything to become a sinner. We were conceived that way. And so we need to be rescued from what? Ourselves. We are personal sinners. We did nothing to become that. We were conceived that way. Now, I know babies are cute. They're beautiful. We love them. But what in legally, standing before God, what is that little baby? It's a sinner. Now, is that child accountable for his sin at this point in time? No. And if a baby dies, where's that baby go? That baby goes to heaven. Yes. And so, when a person reaches the age where they understand who they are, they understand the concept of the gospel and how it applies to them. When they realize that they're separated from God by their sin, at that point, they become accountable. Now, we are told that people don't understand their actual condition. And I, the reason I think is, is, is pretty simple. Um, you talk about people being a sinner. And people will tell you, well, I've never killed anybody. I've never stolen. You know, I take care of my family. And they'll give you a list of good things. Or a list of things that are particularly heinous. That they think is just awful. I've never done any of those things. Therefore, I am not. Well, therefore, you are. Because this definition does not spring from our behavior. It springs from our biology. See, I can change my behavior. I cannot change my biology. Here's a, here's a guy, and he says he's a woman. No, he's not. No, he's not. Now, can he change his behavior? Can he put on a pair of high heel shoes? Heaven help us, yes. Yes. Does that make him a woman? No. You know? And, but, but the world wants, you know, if, 
if they are going to be deceived to that point, they want you to be deceived as well. They want you to believe that. I'm not going to do that, folks. I cannot do that, and, and neither can you, because it is biologically impossible, and we're all aware of that. Now, God gave us what we needed. What did man need? What did we need? We needed a redeemer. Uh, now, to redeem, uh, how many of y'all remember S&H Green Stamps? Remember those? Up in Lakeland, years ago, there was what was called a redemption center. We lived in Mulberry, dad pastor down there. And, and so when you went to a grocery store, uh, depending on how much money you spent, they would give you, I don't know, a couple of sheets of green stamps. It was my job to lick them nasty things and put them in the book. And so, you know, uh, you'd lick and put them in the book. And, and if mom wanted, uh, I don't know, a, a new set of knives or a blender, and it took 25 books, well, she would save all those, and then we'd go up to Lakeland to the Redemption Center, and we'd have all them books with my DNA in it. And we'd give them to the guy, and, and she would look at the catalog and say, I want this right here. I want that blender. And there was a there was an as, kind of an assembly line thing behind her, a, a, a belt, and he would make a phone call, and in just a few minutes, here comes that that blender behind. Now, when he took it off the belt and gave it to my mom, and she gave who did it belong to? So that was mom's blender, the redemption center. You could not go in there and get a blender without paying the price. You understand we have been redeemed? What does it take to redeem something? A price. Where was the redemption center for the human species? The cross of Jesus Christ. That's where our price was paid. But here's, here's the problem. Death is the payment for sin. But what if a person dies, lost? What if a person dies is there, is there any coming back from that? No, it's an eternal death sentence. Jesus came, and he died the death that was assigned to us. And he came back to life after three days. And now, the, every, everything came out of the grave except sin. And the Christian's sin has been done away with. I don't understand this statement, but here's what the Bible says. That as far as the east is from the west, how far is that? All right, question. Is this east right here on the corner, is that east? Is this not east? Where's east? All right, that's east, right? What is this then? Well, wait a minute. What is this? What is this? West? What, yeah, you understand what I'm saying? How far is that? There, there is no delineation. There's no way to express what happened to our sin account other than it was paid for. As far as the east is from the west, the two will never meet. That will never be assigned to you again. And so the Bible tells us that God loved the world like this. Not so, not volume, even though that's true. But that's not what this word means. Joe, uh, verse number 16 says, He loved us in such a condition that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. And that word perish means to be fully destroyed. The Christian will never be fully destroyed never be destroyed at all when we leave this life the Bible tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for the believer and so here we are every every religion brings sacrifices that's just the way man functions Christianity is the only faith where God sacrificed for us.
And so not only did he give us what we want, I wanted to be made right. I wanted that. I, I, just, I didn't know who. And God provided the who. Not only did he provide what I want, he provided what I need. What did I need? What did you need? As a person outside of, of the, the perimeters of God's acceptance, what did we need? We needed somebody to let us come inside of God's acceptance. And what did Jesus say? I'm the door. I am the only way in. You can't crawl in back here. You can't jump over back there. I am the door to eternal life. That's it. And so uh, I'm beyond thankful that our God has given us, number one, what we wanted. He gave us what we needed. If you're here this morning and you have never accepted Christ, um, your sin accounts in your own name. Now, this is not just philosophy. I'm not telling you religious philosophy. I'm telling you the facts of the scripture. Jesus said this. If you believe not that I am he. What's the consequence of that? You what? You will die in your sin. You will die with your sin account in your own name. You don't want to do that. Because it's an eternal death sentence. There is, well, I'll be there for 20 years and get out in good behavior. There, there is no release from that. And so Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. This is the, the premier Bible Old Testament scholar in Israel. And he didn't understand this. And Jesus tells him, you must be born again. I mean, Nicodemus is, is painting this, this wonderful picture. Oh, man, we, we know that nobody can do this stuff except you come from God. I mean, he just building him up, and then Jesus whacks him off at the knees and said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, whoa, whoa, what did you just say? How can a man be born again? I don't, I don't understand this. And Jesus said, you're the, you're the master in Israel, and you don't understand these things? And he didn't. And then he goes on to explain, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. That's a, that's a gift that is beyond comprehension to me. Again, we've got, we've got gifts that we're wearing today. You've got gifts in your house. You've got gifts probably hanging on the wall, hanging in your closet, in your jewelry drawer. You've got gifts somewhere that someone that loved you gave you. And, and when you see those gifts, it reminds you of your relationship with them. Well, here we are. We have had the greatest gift provided for us. And I think it only appropriate that I look at this gift that's been given to me and that it draws me closer to the God who gave it. Because he gave me what I needed. He gave me everything I needed. And if you're here and you've never accepted that, um, why? Why haven't you accepted that yet? Is there another offer out there somewhere? Is someone else in the place of Christ? No. No, everything else is a cistern that man has dug with his own hands and is full of poison. Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. It's what we needed. And I pray that if there's someone today that has never accepted this gift, I don't know if anyone has ever turned down a gift even if it's a cheap one. Lord, this, the most precious gift that has ever been offered, and most people have rejected it. And I pray that no one in this building has done that, and if there happens to be one, may today be the day that their heart receives this, the greatest of gifts, and that they come to Christ today. I ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. As we stand at the rain place, if you need to come this morning, would you?
come. appreciate your presence and I'll be back tonight six o'clock we have our evening service and uh, we'll sit over here on Sunday nights and it, it, it's like a classroom situation very informal if you have a question raise your hand and ask it and I may not have the answer but uh, I've got books and uh, you know, I'm, I'm making find your answer for you but hope you'll be back tonight uh, let's see Saturday ladies don't don't forget and tonight after church right we need some help setting up some tables and uh, uh, that's the teenagers do it. Yeah, the teenagers, they've got all the muscle and the uh, good. Uh, Y'all wash my car while you're at it. As a matter of fact, you want to do that. Um, all right. Anything else before we go? Am I overlooking anything? All right. <laughs> okay. If you didn't get your picture taken last week, uh, hang around. We want to get your picture for. Uh, our book so uh, keep that in mind all right let's bow for prayer lord thank you so much for your goodness watch over us as we go home we love you in jesus name amen